Hi there, and welcome back. Last time we explored the way George Orwell toys with our emotions in order to plant an idea in our heads. We'll be asking the same question today of Kurt Vonnegut's Cat's Cradle. How does Vonnegut manipulate us, and how does he plant an idea in our heads? Whereas in my last video, we looked at one scene in particular, today we'll be taking a more overarching approach. But there will still be a scene later on that we'll take a look at and analyze. And like I mentioned before, I tend to speak rather quickly which often means you don't have time to read everything on the slide before I move on. Don't worry though, I designed these presentations so you don't have to. But if you're just a thorough person like that, then that's cool too. Feel free to stop the video at any point and catch up on any and everything you missed. Additionally, don't worry if you haven't read or don't really remember Cat's Cradle. If there's something you need to know, I'll let you know. Now let's get started. From the first page, Vonnegut throws you off balance. You expect a novel, and you find an enigma. The first page reads, Nothing in this book is true. Live by the FOMA that make you brave and kind and healthy and happy. From the books of Bakanon 1.5. FOMA, of course, are harmless untruths. We are already introduced to a few key ideas that not only define the novel, but this presentation as well. Vonnegut makes use of a faux religion known as Bakanism, and often references made-up words like FOMA, which require definitions in order to be understood. In fact, here's a list of all the vocabulary words thrown at us throughout the book. If we approach this use of vocabulary as a tactical rather than a stylistic choice, we discover that Vonnegut uses Bakanism and words like FOMA to replicate the effect of the sci-fi genre. Both are intended to create an unrealistic setting around very real ideas, in this case, the unrealistic being the religion and the vocabulary in order to convey a message that delivered normally would offend or even enrage the audience. We must realize that what is to come is by itself offensive, but we must also treat this offense in the same light, humorous way Vonnegut delivers it to us. These next few slides will highlight the offense mentioned in the last. On the subject of truth, Vonnegut writes, I am a Bacchanist now. I would have been a Bacchanist then, if there had been anyone to teach me the bittersweet lies of Bacchanon. This, of course, forces us to realize that the narrator was once like us, but has since learned and improved upon himself. Our way of life, his previous way of life, must be flawed. And so we are drawn to the bittersweet lies of Bacchanon. The same thing is done here. Truth and knowledge, things we consider to be sacred, are defiled and tossed to the side, showing us that neither are really what they're cracked up to be. And finally, an attack on truth leads us straight into the open arms of Bacchanism. You can start to see a pattern here. Again, attacking societal pillars, Vonnegut comments on religion. Here, we realize that if we are unable to understand, to accept, that any useful religion is based on lies, we will not understand this book either. He plays on our ego and pits our desire to understand the novel against our beliefs and nearly forces us to side with the former. Here again, he attacks religion. And finally, Vonnegut presents a paraphrase, or more accurately, a rewrite of religious scripture, and at the same time convinces us to welcome this idea with open arms. The following quotes are more scattered in terms of category, but still strive to reframe the way we look at the world. Vonnegut convinces us, using the same technique as before, that we should agree gaily to go anywhere anyone suggested, which of course seems folly and immature out of context, but must certainly be worth more coming from a Bacchanist. Here, he uses feuding statements to show that Bacchanon was against science, and so we should be too. And finally, Vonnegut crafts this, packet, this passage to demonstrate that by Bacchanism, a thoughtful man has nothing to hope for for mankind. Nothing. Whew, believe it or not, that was all just the setup for Vonnegut's big punchline. <laughs> Get it? Because he's a black humorist? Oh wow, that was sad. Okay, anyway, the following two passages captivate what Vonnegut strives to teach us through Bacchanism. First, that good societies are built only by pitting good against evil. 
and maintaining the tension created between them. And second, that truth is, by its very nature, evil, and so it is necessary to provide the people with better and better lies, so as to disguise the horror that is truth. Now what we've covered so far makes up about 240 of the 280-some pages in Cat's Cradle. Vonnegut spent nearly 90% of his novel attempting to convince us that Bacchanism is the way to go, that tension and lies serve us better than peace and truth. The scene that I'm about to show you is a speech given by an ambassador of a small country in the middle of the Caribbean Ocean. Further context is not necessary for your understanding. We begin out of nowhere when the speaker proclaims that he is about to tell the truth. We're caught off guard to say the least. His speech reveals various truths like children murdered in war are simply murdered children all the same. That if we are to pay our respects, we must confront our own stupidity and vivaciousness, and that perhaps we are more like brute animals than civilized human beings. The former two I believe to be the most intense, or rather truthful, in the series. His speech continues to present a solution, reduce the stupidity and vivaciousness of ourselves and of all mankind. Quite a bold statement. He ends up with what the book calls a calypso, or what we would call a poem. He talks about peace, brotherly love, plenty, and what a paradise this world would be if men were kind and wise. But the would-be stands out as the defining component. The world will never actually be this way. This is a fantasy, a dream, a myth that is not only unachievable, but foolish to even consider. Now we're torn between ideas. For 240 pages, we were spoon-fed the bittersweet lies of Bacchanon, and we grew to like them. They seemed to comfort us and abate the evils of reality. And in three pages, our lies stacked one on top of the other, came crashing down all at once. So now what? I'll tell you what. The following 30 pages depicted a horrific end of the world and death to, to humanity. So in the end, what was Vonnegut's response to truth? Complete destruction. What does that tell you? It seems pretty clear to me that truth like that, truth that hurts, truth that is real, results in nothing but complete destruction. And like that, in an instant, we become liars. We become FOMA. We become Bacchanists. Thanks, and see you next time.